Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly program that centers around what's going on in the world of the Beatles newswise. I'm Ken Michaels, known for my Beatles program called Every Little Thing, syndicated around the country. And I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Beatles Examiner himself, and that, of course, is Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everybody. On today's show, it's a very special program because we have a guest with us on the phone, and it's someone that Beatle fans are very much aware of because he's been part of Paul McCartney's band since 2001. So that's a mighty long time, and that's quite an accomplishment right there to itself. And we've got Rusty Anderson on the phone. Welcome to Things We Said Today, Rusty. Hello there, Ken, and hello there, everybody. Hello there, Steve. And hopefully I didn't exclude anyone, all <laughs> included in uh, this greeting. <laughs> well, we have Rusty here on the phone because um, he has a brand new record to talk about. And I think for all the folks who have seen Rusty in concert with Paul, uh, they might want to know a little bit more about him. So I thought that we'd start off uh, the conversation by asking about your background. And, and more importantly, um, as a guitar player, who have been your biggest influences? Oh, man, there's so many. Uh, you know, everyone from Jimi Hendrix and so many. Mick Ronson's a big one. Hmm. Uh, you know, the blues guys, uh, you know, Skip James and Robert Johnson and that. And um, the Book of White, you know, to uh, Adrian Ballou, um, Jeff Beck. You know, I could go on and on. That's uh, a pretty wide palette right there. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a little schizophrenic, I would say, in, in that respect. You know, I just kind of, whatever inspires me at the time, you know, I I, I just kind of, uh, I don't know, become a fan of for a moment or for a lifetime or whatever. I, I love Debussy. He's my favorite, uh, the classical guys. Mm. And uh, Gershwin and, you know, uh, Rachmaninoff and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so many, so many influences, but uh Yeah. Did you always have these eclectic tastes, or was it just something you developed over a long period of time? Um, I think it's, you know, it's developed over a bit of time. You know, my, my parents weren't really musicians per se, but my dad, you know, he put, used to play some, you know, we had an organ sitting in the living room, he'd play that a bit and play some, uh, you know, I think a little bit of banjo and trumpet back in the day, and my grandfather sang, and I, in fact I have his uh, mandolin still. And it was a very eclectic sort of group of records in... in uh, sitting around and and you know i think if, if you listen to most people's uh iphones or whatever that they've got a group of songs that are very across the board very eclectic very few people like i only listen to heavy metal or i only listen to reggae or whatever you know it's hmm. people have a lot of diverse diversified taste for the most part and i think that's a sort of a, a product of this you know era too and that's kind of what you've done with your recording career, correct, Rusty? That you're... It would seem so, yeah. I just kind of go where my muse goes and uh, and try not to edit myself too much and not worry about niche marketing myself so much. Because, you're, because uh, your earlier albums have all kind of been cut all sorts of different uh, areas, you know, and, and mm -hmm. that's been one of the... That's one of the things I noticed when, I, when uh, we talked before... And I was uh, writing about your last album. How many albums do you have? Is it four albums now, or is well, there's there's three albums out, and then there's a single for the third. But the the third record is really sort of a uh, a greatest collection, greatest hits kind of thing, if you will, of the, of mm -hmm. the first two. And then the uh, the new record, which isn't out yet, the first single's out, and it's called Effortless. And um, that one, it, it's actually. Uh, a band name, which is Rusty Anderson Afternoon, and um, you, you actually tried to get people to name the band, and I'm wondering, yeah, what, I did. What, I did what, sort of like a committee naming thing. What What made you pick Rusty Anderson Afternoon? That was well, kind of, I think that was, that was that was sort of the most popular one that people uh, sort of picked because there was a, you know, I put out a number of choices plus, you know, name put in your own suggestion. Mm-hmm. And I figured, you know, someone came up with a suggestion that was better than any of the other ones. But that was the one that sort of got the most picks. And the thing I like about it is it's very sort of transparent and innocuous, and and, uh, and I kind of like that, you know. But uh, the reason for the band name is because uh, it's it's 
a band effort. Um, Todd, uh, who plays bass, he's um, we're sharing vocals and sharing uh, songwriting, and so it's really not just Rusty Anderson solo. It's it's a band thing. But you know, having the background and stuff, I figured it was probably a good idea to keep my name in, involved with it. So it's sort of a hybrid concept. If you mm. yeah, it's good to get the fans involved. Yeah, exactly. I, I, it, it's curious. Uh, it's a curious thing always until you until you get feedback from people about what is kind of uh, you know people are, what are people responding to. You know, so it's cool. It's interesting. You well, connect that, with people that way too. Yeah, uh, the music that I've heard from you. I always notice that it's very strong melodically. Mm -hmm. So is that a cool. very key, uh, an important part of your music, you, that you strive to have so. very strong I, melodies? Know, I, something that's developed with me over the years, I think I've always been a melodically based writer and, and player, too, You know, because I play in a lot of other people's records, and that's, the, that's one of the things I always try to interject into the music, You know, because like, if you're going to play on someone's uh, tunes... Uh, you might as well uh, try to add something of yourself that's, you know, will sort of up the game of the song or white right. water, right? So I guess that's something that I've always sort of uh, found interesting. That's the goal anyway. And, um, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Who would you say has influenced you as a songwriter as opposed to as a guitar player? Uh, songwriting, oh, God, so many. I mean, certainly the Beatles uh, were, when I was five years old, that was when my sister was playing Beatles records, and I, that kind of started my interest in music. And my, my uh, older brother, who passed away, he was 19 and I was five, right at that time I sort of got into the Beatles and music, and real life sort of was, was the pits. And music and, you know, uh, this, you know it's a, such an untouchable thing. The mm -hmm. whole, sound of music and and i think the you know the the concept of a band and you know a group of guys that were all like you know uh part of a, a greater good sort of like an egoless team thing hmm. the whole combo of that and the aesthetic really appealed to me and that's what i just focused on i've kind of been doing the same thing since i was five basically Can but I, I just sort of hit me recently about how the timing of you know my brother you know passing away and that happening at the same time i think that's one of the reasons that i've been such a focused tunnel vision music person ever since. Can I ask what your earliest memory of the Beatles is? What my earliest memory of the Beatles? Yeah, uh, I don't want to age you and say you're old, uh, you're old enough to have seen them on a television. Oh no! Are. I, yeah, I never did get to see them, but I I just remember you know um, seeing pictures of them and hearing the music and just sort of falling in love with the whole thing and you know like a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. And then I got into, you know, I, I mean, I was always into the Beatles, but then I always got in, I got into, like, you know, Jimi Hendrix and Cream and uh, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention and, you know, David Bowie and uh, blah, 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 all, all sorts of other artists. Mm -hmm. um, but, that yeah, the Beatles were sort of the first one. And uh, I can't really name, I don't think I was aware of what I was seeing or... Or not seeing. I do. I my very first record was Help, though. I do know that the American okay. version. There we go. Because hmm. I'm American. <laughs> <laughs> so you're pretty firmly rooted in in '60s rock, although you've worked with a lot of contemporary artists that went far beyond the '60s. Yes. You mean as far as in the studio with other artists, or in the music well, that I you mean, record like, for I, yourself? I yeah. Well, well, Paul played on. Uh, on Hurt Myself, which is the off the first record I did. Um, he played bass and sang background and stuff like that. And mm. play, actually played a little guitar, too. Stuart Copeland, who I was in a band with, uh, came, uh, called Animal Logic a few years back, he came in and played drums on a song called Catbox Beach. That was also off the first record. Um, is, is that what you mean? I mean that the songs that you write and record for yourself kind of have a 60s feel to them. Mm-hmm. Because of yeah, all these yeah, people I, that you mentioned. Yeah, I guess the 60s, uh, to me, it was such a, uh, an explosive sort of renaissance time. You know, music just really expanded to that point. And one of the things that I loved, and I think that we already talked about, was that, you know, I have a very diversified taste. And that's what I liked about the 60s, too. There was a lot of different uh, components, you know, going into one record. Mm -hmm. And I guess maybe it's funny because Paul McCartney is very much that way, and I think that that's one thing that that's maybe through osmosis rubbed off 
and to my world is that uh, I, too, am sort of uh, very eclectic-minded. And I think that's a 60s thing. And maybe it could be, a you know, a Beatles thing, too, or who knows which came first, the chicken or the egg. Uh-huh. <laughs> right? uh, Paul, Paul is about as diverse as you can get. That's what I mean. I mean, you know, we're playing the live show, and we go everywhere from, like, uh, you know, uh, Yesterday or, or uh, some, you know, ballet song, uh, And I Love Her, to Helter Skelter. It's really, <laughs> you know, it's probably one of the most diverse shows anyone could possibly see. True. True. Well, I listen Very to true. a lot of Paul's albums and a lot of Beatle albums, and I always say the White Album is the most eclectic album ever, probably. It is, right? It goes Can all I over the place. Can I ask a little bit about the single um, and the video? Um, who was involved in that? And when is also, when is the album coming out? Well, the song's called Effortless. I'm not sure yet when the album's coming out. It, it will be out probably the next month or two. Uh, and the, uh, the video uh, was put together by a chap named Paul White. And um, it primarily features uh, Todd who, like I said, we, we sing together in the group, and, and it's called Rusty Anderson Afternoon. And he plays bass, I play guitar, and we both co-write, and Matt's also, in, and he's the uh, rhythm guitar player and, uh, and background singer, and he uh, is in the video also. And, uh, and a friend of ours who is the uh, classic con- conceptual fair maiden, um, her name is Vanessa Peters, and uh, she did a lovely job. Yes, she uh, did. Hmm. Yeah, so um, uh, there you have it. Yeah, check it out. What was yeah, the the idea to do this this video, which is like a silent movie, black and white kind of, and you're dressed in that kind of garb, smoking a pipe, you know, and uh, wearing a vest, and you look very much the part. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it was just you know throwing around concepts, uh, hanging out at my my house, which was built in the twenties, so we ended up using that as the uh, as is a lot of the, the location. And uh, I don't really know exactly where it came from, other than maybe just because we were surrounded with a 20s-style house. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. It came out great, though. It really did. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it was, it was uh, really fun to make. You know, how many times does one make a video? It's sort of like a... It's a lot of work, but it's, uh, it's always just a fun adventure, and you never really know what you're going to get until you do it. What other uh, things are on the album that you can that you can talk about uh, at this point? I mean, what else? What other kind of song, songs can we look forward to? Uh, well, yeah, you'll you'll hear it. I mean, the the, the tunes are are what they are. I, we could get into that, but without it being released, I, I will say uh, that I I actually it looks like I have a new Gibson guitar signature model coming out very soon. Ooh. Um, so you can look forward to that, people, you know, the guitar playing people. Uh, and it's it's a really cool act. I've been working on it. I think we've got three prototypes, and the third one I'm really into. And uh, it's a it's basically a, a sort of a version of a blonde 59 335. And uh, so I don't know what the release date exactly on that is yet, but it's been a while in the making, and now it uh, looks like it's, it's, uh, it's all we were talking about, all the specifics and contracts and all that stuff, so... Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we, we might do some sort of event or something around that. I'm um, looking forward to that. And the tune Effortless is, uh, I believe it's on w, uh, R&R and rotation there and a number of Indy 103 possibly. There's a few stations that are starting to add it, which is really cool. Okay. Very nice. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Before we talk about your work with Paul, I was really impressed when I saw a list of just some of the people that you've done session work with. Uh, I'm just going to read a list of a few names. Carol King, uh, Matthew Sweet, Neil Diamond, Fishbone, Belinda Carlisle. Again, musically across the board here. Stevie Nicks, Elton John, Santana. That must have been a dream since you're yeah, you know, another great guitar player there. Yeah. Um, Willie Nelson. What's it like for you to do session work? Do you enjoy it as much as doing your own uh, individual well, it's music? It's very different. Um, it, it's really exciting and fun, you know, because I've done... I've played on so many recordings, whether they're my own or other, for other artists, and on, on a lot of different levels. I do also do producing and, and writing with people, and um, and so each situation is sort of its own thing. And some of them are kind of like uh, a little forgettable, and some of them are 
very unforgettable. Like working with Elton John was really interesting when uh, uh, I walked in there and uh, and and was sort of embraced. It was sort of a family vibe, which was nice. <laughs> um, working with Paul Bushnell, a uh, bass player who I was in a, in a band with called Edna Swap in the 90s, and uh, and then uh, Matt Chamberlain on drums. And, and it was really interesting, you know, working with Elton and Bernie Toppin, because Bernie would put together, like, you know, he had the 80 sets of lyrics, and he'd hand some lyrics to Elton, and he would start writing the song. In 15 minutes, he'd have a song, and then we'd sit there, and I'd, you know, sit next to him and write down the chords while he's playing piano, and then just start tracking the song. And uh, it was a very organic process. And uh, Wow. Yeah, it's, it was really cool. It was uh, Some people work a song to death, and some people do it really quickly. And I don't know that one is better than the other. Um, it's two, you know different ways to do it, and and I've sort of done it all with different artists. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So wow. I, and I feel like I've I've learned a lot about recording, and it's also funny now that um, uh, after after my band Edna Swap, I sort of thought, okay, maybe I'll just be doing you know studio stuff and and kind of take a breather here, and then Paul comes along, and all of a sudden I'm you know on the road a lot. <laughs> the last decade, I can't believe how much I've been on the road. Of the, the places I've seen, pretty amazing. You know? I, I feel really lucky in that respect that I sort of stumbled into a very cool scene, and uh, very appreciative of, of that. Now that all that all happened because of your association with David Kahn, right? Well, yeah, David was one producer I worked with a lot, and uh, he got the gig with Paul and brought Abe and I in, and then. Uh, we did the Driving Rain record, and then it all sort of turned into the live situation. I think we first started officially touring in 2002. We did the uh, the Madison Square Garden uh, concert for New York in right. 2001, which was also a trip because uh, the Sandy benefit, which was basically 10 years later, and a lot of the same cast of characters, was sort of, in a way, it was sort of a homecoming, like in Madison Square Garden and the whole same thing, and, and uh, it was really interesting to be part of both of those events. Yeah, wow. Which was also similar to right after we did, uh, I think it was 2002, we did uh, the Queen's Jubilee, and then we did it again 10 years later. Mm. uh, Yeah, so it's an interesting perspective. It's a very different circuit, but it's still sort of a circuit. you know. There's so many great events that you were a part of. If you could pick just a few of the most memorable concerts that you've done with Paul... What would they I be? mean, the, the, the thing is, is that they're all, in a weird way, they're all super memorable, even though I can't remember them all, because we've done a lot of, you know, like the same, the same show for, you know, when you, especially in America, the, all these arenas sort of look the same from the inside and the backstage and all that. Hmm. And then, uh, and then Europe's a little more uh, diverse in that department. But yeah, I mean, we played, uh, you know, from uh, Red Square, we did, we did in St. Petersburg. We've played in Japan, and we've played, uh, you know, um, we got to go hang out in Osaka and in between, um, I mean, in Kyoto, in between Osaka and in, in, in Tokyo. Uh, we did, uh, we played the, the Rome Coliseum out in front of that, and inside also, actually. Wasn't that the um, biggest one? The biggest one in terms well, of I attendance? That, uh, as far as people there physically, the Queen's Jubilee, the second one, I think they were supposed said to be over a million in the street, but I couldn't see them all. I just, you know, there was a certain cutoff point, and a lot of it maybe was piped out into the street with, with PA. I know that the Rome was about 500,000, um, but then, like, the, the Olympics was certainly very unforgettable, and that was just a crazy wild spectacle. And that, I think, the, the viewership was something like, I don't know, that was definitely the biggest. I mean, millions and millions of people watched the Olympics opening ceremony. Right. Hmm. But so, some of those Mexican and South American shows have been astounding. Oh, yeah, but, they've been huge and, and really fun, and the audiences, I think, in South America are, are particularly uh, vivacious and, and passionate. And uh, and it's funny because, you know, you might go to some place, maybe uh, Scandinavia or, or wherever, and the audiences are a little more subdued. Uh, and then maybe you go to Mexico or something, and they're super... Brazil or wherever, and they're very, very passionate. But I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. Like, if I was in the audience, I'd probably be listening and and really paying attention and and focusing as opposed to screaming and making noise. And it's not like that's better. 
But I think as a performer, it's more exciting when you hear people screaming and singing along and all that. But it's it's just funny how you see the sort of different tendencies of of the different cultures and the way they they uh, participate in a concert. It's very right. different. But it's also, you know, despite the fact that Paul's done a lot of performing in his lifetime, there's still so many areas around the world that he hasn't played or hasn't played for a long time. And when right. he plays well, someplace like somebody, Russia... I mean, I think he also, you know, given his the schedule with his daughter and and his lifestyle and all that, um, sort of picks the ones that make sense, you know, at the time. And, uh, and it doesn't always seem logical, although... It is for, hmm. for that world. <laughs> but I, I was I was just saying that because there are these areas of the world where where Paul has either never played or people have waited forever. It's a very emotional thing. I mean, when I watch yeah. the concert in Russia, there are people crying in the audience. They've waited a whole lifetime to see him. Oh yeah, it happens all the time. I mean, the the crying thing. I was, we were at a show and. And this girl in front of me, in probably three quarters of the songs we'd launch into, she just burst out into tears, and and I couldn't look at her because <laughs> mm. I because I understood, you know, some people you seem crying or whatever, you go, okay, that's a re- reaction, but some people you have to be careful because they can suck you in, and all of a sudden it's like you're kind of experiencing it with them, <laughs> you know, and it, it can be dangerous when you're trying to do your job. Yeah. Can you go through, one thing I've always been curious about, when you're dealing with songs that are classics, and so many of these songs are, especially the Beatles songs and certain solo songs that everybody knows, Mm -hmm. is there a tendency for you to say, I've got to be loyal to the way George Harrison played it, or the way it was on the record, or does Paul just let you have freedom to do whatever you want? Well, it's sort of a hybrid. I mean, I I think that, that one of the reasons that this band has been together a long time and worked well is because everyone kind of gets it they they sort of i think their their perspective and certainly mine is like you want to honor the classic arrangements of these songs because they're so brilliant but you also don't want to just karaoke it and and just do everything exactly like copy every nuance i mean i think it's important be, uh, it, it's there's a multitude of of aspects going on one is it's important to 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 put one's personality into the moment of the event of playing the playing the song because it's live it's a live performance and there's not we don't have a click track going on we don't have computers playing stuff it's not machine music and a lot of the music that you hear live is that way you know right Uh, a lot of drummers out there you see a drummer but he's actually got a little thing in his ear and a little click, click track going and everything's on a grid and all these other instruments are playing things that's the opposite of of what we are we're organic band and I think that, you know, I mean, if the Beatles were alive today and they were playing these songs or Wings or whoever, that it wouldn't be this, like, sort of carbon copy uh, approach to making the music. It's more about sort of making it work in a live medium and having that urgency. And I think that it's important to keep that feel going. And uh, so um, I think, you know, the response has been pretty great as far as that, as far as I think our interpretations of the song. And it's it's a, it's sort of walking that line of, of being respectful and also not being too respectful to the point of, uh, you know, just being a, a carbon copy. Right. Is there an unknown every night when you go out there that you don't know what you're going to be, do- what everybody else is going to be doing and you kind of play oh, off yeah, that? Oh, yeah, you know, we'll make mistakes. We'll start songs again. Well, you know, there's it's it's actually kind of loose, you know. I mean, we... There's a lot of focus, and I think when you're on the road and you play a lot, and you, you, you get pretty tight, but there's also a time when maybe someone will misread the set list, or, <laughs> you know, we've, we've done some funny things, but it's always cool. It, there's, there's a nice, it seems to be that there's a, a good vibe in the audience when those moments happen, because everyone knows then it, it's actually live, and that, um, that they're seeing something that isn't, you know, the same exact thing every night. Right. Yeah, and there's they're, also they're, improvised solos, you know, I'll, I'll go up and do things uh, different. I mean, it's a little different every night. I never, you know... And that's what keeps it fresh. Exactly the same performance any two nights, or certainly Paul doesn't. Yeah. What's the, what's the it, it, as, you know, as much as you can say, what's the process of uh, adding to the set list? Uh, I think you said before when we talked that you guys do have input. 
that it's not just Paul making. Yeah, the yeah. I used to have, I re- used to be a little more assertive about my opinion, mm-hmm. and you know, just try to you know nudge Paul. Hey, we should do blah 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 or this you know, and you know, I suggested say you know uh, too many people or um, day tripper getting better or helter skelter things like that. But as time's gone on, I've seen how you know you could have. You could ask a million people what the set list should be, and you'd get a million different responses. Everyone from the super fans to the, you know, the sort of occasional listeners have a different opinion about what songs they want to hear. Right. And so, you know, you can't be too, um, what's the word, myopic about it, because it's not that kind of a thing. And, I mean, there's certain songs that I like better than others, but at the same time, you know, uh, it, it is a group committee kind of thing, because it's... It's the committee of the whole audience and all around the world. It's the committee of the band. And, you know, ultimately, Paul, you know, calls the shots. But I think he views it that way, too, that he's not just doing it for himself. He's doing it for the whole, uh, you know, for the tour. So. Mm-hmm. Did you guys, when you, because one of the things, we did a whole show on the first uh, on the first show on the tour and all the set list changes, and we were just, we were absolutely floored at the, at the, some of the songs you guys brought in, we I mean we were we were very pleased. And, well, and I was I was <laughs> most surprised with being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. Yeah, I know I was too. That's something Paul just wanted to play. Like cool. So then uh, that that took some work because it's it's such a, an elaborate arrangement of instruments and sounds that you know aren't very uh, uh, commonplace. So. Right. Were you hearing the, the, what what people were asking for, what the super fans were asking for, or did you guys just go in and say we're just gonna we're just gonna um, change things up and and you know do what do what sounds good? I think it's a combo. I'm not even sure really. I know that 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 a lot of people might write into Paul's website and ask for things, and they always that you know making suggestions to me, and sometimes I I go oh yeah that's a great idea. You know, or sometimes they go, I've never heard that song, and then finally listen to it, and it's like maybe it's an okay song with an amazing vocal, or mm-hmm. it's uh, it's this cool song, but it, you know, it's not really the right instrumentation for this band, or you know, there's a lot of things, and plus Paul has so many songs, That's right. so many records. I mean, it's, it's the output is is ridiculous. You could play all these songs, these obscure songs, but most people wouldn't know them. They, you know, most people in the audience know the the songs that got radio airplay. Right. So, which is a lot of them already. I mean, you just take the hits and you're done. You know, you don't have to look any farther, which which is unusual because most artists aren't that, uh, you know, endowed with <laughs> with hit songs. And Paul's so actually it's, had it's a lot a of hits. Crazy catalog. He's had a lot of hits that he's never done live. Still. Exactly. Can we expect set list changes down the road? And can we also expect a recording or a DVD? Um, set list can you changes. say anything? There's, it always morphs. Um, but, you know, it depends how long it takes. Okay. Uh, the set list, you know, and from one, it might even be called the same tour, but there might be a couple of different songs or okay. whatever. I mean, I know that this tour out there, uh, there's been a, a lot of set changes. And as far as DVDs and stuff, uh, I don't know. I bet, I kind of bet there will be, but I haven't heard any specific uh, plans for it. Can I ask one last question about the tours? Sure. Um, I've noticed that through the years, Paul has done certain songs in Europe that he won't do in the U.S. Songs like "Come Mull and Get of It." Kintyre. Uh, well, uh. Mull of Kintyre at certain areas, um, he will do Mull of Kintyre. But I- I'm talking about "Come and Get It" recently. The word he did, "You Won't See Me." I say he. I mean you guys. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, she's leaving home. Those songs are, are. Is there a reason why he only does it in that area? That's and then... a good question. I might ask the same question. I don't really know. I mean, I know that, for instance, uh, uh, Hope of Deliverance uh, was was big in Latin America and I think Germany, so that's why we played it. We haven't played it here because of that. Um, as far as, like, Beatle tunes, uh, Come and Get It or, or You Won't See Me or whatever, uh, I think that was just sort of happenstantial, sort of random. I, I don't think it's been really that uh, sort of clocked or deliberate. And, you know, those songs have sort of been thrown around. Maybe You Won't See Me or some of those. And who knows, they might end up back in the set list. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I don't really know what to say about them. Okay. 
Okay. Well, surprise us and do Mulligan Tire here, will you? <laughs> uh, well, that usually we do with the with the uh, the full on uh, bagpipe band. It, right. In certain areas, you know, like say Scotland or some places in Canada, you know, mm-hmm. will actually have a bagpipe band. But uh, you know, and and the song was a huge hit in certain areas. Right. You know, right. so it's it's sort of uh, what do you call it uh, regionally appropriate, I guess. <laughs> okay. So, Rusty, it was you that suggested too many people? Yes. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love that song. It's cool, right? <laughs> oh, it's a great song. No, no doubt about it. Really it really is. You know, I wish he'd do more from Ram, but, you know, like we said, there's so much in his catalog. You know, yeah, he can't you do have all of them. kind of look at the whole big picture because it is, it's a worldwide event. It's not just, um, you know, if you have some cult favorite band and you go see them and they, you know... That's one thing, but it's like the biggest cult on the planet, kind of. So, <laughs> okay, well, yeah. we've got to wrap things up here. Rusty, I, I'm sure you know, anytime you want to, you can come back on the show. When uh, the new album's released, by all means, feel free to join us, and we'll talk about it. The Thank new songs. you very, very much. Yeah, it's my pleasure, and uh, check out Effortless, see what you think. Oh, I, we both have heard it. We, we both love have the heard song. It and, and we suggest to everybody listening to check it out. Yes, and Definitely. as a matter of fact, right at the end of this show, we're going to play the song for you. Great. There we, there we go. Thanks again, cool. Rusty. So, for the Beatles, things we said today, I'm Ken Michael saying thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying see you next time. Okay, kids. Take care. It's Rusty. Have fun. My mind.